All right, hey everyone, I'm uh, Michael. I work on the PyTorch JIT, and I'm here to talk about what we've been working on in the last year and we're releasing with 1.3. PyTorch JIT. So let's start with some background. What is uh, the PyTorch JIT? Well, in a sentence, it's a compiler and language infrastructure for machine learning. So that's a bit of a mouthful. And most of the time when I say that, uh, people don't really know what I'm talking about. So I think a better way of describing the JIT is functionally and what it delivers to you all. And for that, it's our technical strategy for delivering PyTorch to a production audience. Uh, we chose this path because we wanted to take the best aspects of PyTorch and adapt them for a new audience and a new group of users with a new set of requirements. So when we looked at the requirements that production users came to us with, it boiled down to two main elements. Uh, the first is portability. PyTorch programs should be decoupled from any specific runtime environment. We love the flexibility, the ease of use, you know, the debugability that Python gives you as a host language for PyTorch. But running Python is difficult and impossible in a number of places that are really important to production users, like uh, multi-threaded inference servers where the gill will be a problem, like on the phone or on a car. And the second requirement uh, is performance. So when we have access to the full model, uh, we can perform a variety of optimizations, layer fusion, quantization, sparsification. And these optimizations are they're possible to implement imperatively in PyTorch's eager mode, but often can be done automatically or with very little effort when you have access to a fully structured representation of your model. So translating these requirements into a technical problem, we found we needed a system that could first capture the structure of PyTorch programs, uh, and while preserving as much of the flexibility and power of, of Python as we could. And second, we wanted to use that structure to perform optimizations in a scalable way. We wanted to uh, give users the ability to write their own transformations and optimizations on top of a general purpose platform. So those two problems correspond to the two main components of the, the PyTorch JIT. Uh, for capturing PyTorch programs, we have TorchScript, a, stat a static subset of the Python language specialized for machine learning applications. And for optimizing the structure of models, we have a just-in-time compiler that can navigate the expressiveness and dynamicity of PyTorch code and use runtime information to optimize your models. So let's take a look at TorchScript first. As I said, uh, it's a subset of Python. One difference is that it's statically typed, although if you don't add a type annotation, our really sophisticated type inference algorithm will say, I guess it's a tensor. Uh, and our general workflow is depicted on the side here. You just prototype your model in regular PyTorch. It's a regular NN module. You have access to all your standard Python debugging tools and tools for development, any Python libraries. And once you're ready, you simply call torch.jit.script on an instance of your module to convert it into a TorchScript model. So you've, if you've used the JIT before uh, 1.3, you might notice that this is a new API. It requires a lot less manual work and annotations from you. Uh, you just develop your model in PyTorch, and we'll take care of parsing and compiling your code into TorchScript uh, with that single call to script. So we try really hard to support Pythonic language constructs. If statements are just if statements. You don't need to do anything special. Uh, if statements across Python values will work, side effects will be preserved as you wrote them, lists should behave like lists, and so on. You don't need to do anything special to get them to work. So once you have your model in TorchScript, it looks something like on the right. You will never really see this, but this is our structured intermediate representation of a PyTorch model. It preserves all the behavior you wrote in the model, but it's in a form that's a little easier for us to optimize and otherwise manipulate. You can run this intermediate representation in our lightweight, thread-safe interpreter, available anywhere you can run C++. And the regularity and structure of our intermediate representation makes it easy to write custom transformations and pattern matchers on your model. And we want to call out that this stuff is not just for inference. Uh, if your input tensors require gradients, we'll make sure our optimizations preserve the autograd semantics, and your backwards will give you correct results, just as if you had used Python as your host language. 
So to give you a sense of what kind of models are expressible in TorchScript, we can use uh, recurrent neural network grammars as a case study. So RNNGs are used to perform semantic parsing of sentences for uh, task-oriented dialogue, like maybe a virtual assistant or a conversational AI might perform. And you know, here we have a paper that uh, one of our teams uh, presented at NeurIPS last year, which proposed some uh, improvements on top of the base RNNG that can achieve state-of-the-art results on task-oriented parsing. So, this model is a really great example of what TorchScript can provide you because it's tremendously complex. It's hi got highly dynamic behavior based on the input, and generally our team found it extremely difficult to rewrite or port to a static graph language. Uh, so when shipping to production, our assistant team basically managed two versions of the model. They had one written in PyTorch that the researchers experimented on and improved constantly, and one written in C++ that was a copy of the one written in Python, but uh, you know, uh, had all the pitfalls, the pitfalls that you might expect. You know, the implementations were hard to keep in sync. Sometimes they were hard to debug semantic differences between uh, the models. And as the research team pushed forward, it was hard to get research results directly to production. The team had to own the deployment of this C++ model, which was a huge pain point as well. So this was a really great use case for TorchScript and the PyTorch JIT. It allowed the team to write their model once in a single form that was easy to experiment on and easy to productionize. And I'd like to give a shout out to Shi Song Zhao, who actually did the work of, of porting this model to TorchScript. So I'll show you a little bit of it here. Uh, here's a bridge version of the forward pass. It's not really important to understand uh, the details of the code. Don't worry too much about reading it. Uh, but the important takeaway here is it's just PyTorch code. It has some small tweaks here and there and some type annotations, but fundamentally, it's the same thing you would write in PyTorch eager mode. So over the last year, we've been adding and expanding to TorchScript's support for the Python language. We know that it's a really big part of why people like PyTorch is how straightforward and simple it is to express your ideas using a regular imperative programming model. You know, it's, it's just Python. Right? And we want to preserve that property throughout the whole workflow, from research to production to deployment. The experience of using PyTorch should feel unified and consistent across all our APIs, even as the way you're using PyTorch changes. So you may have to tighten the screws a little bit, add a type annotation here, tweak the model a bit there, but the path should be smooth and well-defined. It shouldn't be like a jump where, oh, okay, we have to go to production, time to rewrite our model. So diving in a bit, I'm just highlighting some of the language features that this model uses that are fully supported by TorchScript and the JIT runtime. For example, we have here complex control flow. We have if statements nested in uh, for loops, nested in while loops. We put a list append here inside the loop, and the side effect works exactly as you would expect as if you were writing Python. Uh, speaking of, we have first class support for common Python data structures like lists and dictionaries. Here you see we're keeping a list of plans, sorting them, pulling plans out to execute them using a slice. So all of the common operations work. Uh, and similarly, you can define your own classes. It helps you organize your data in a, in a regular object-oriented way. Here, the plan object is presented as a bag of data. You know, it's got some state and a, and a less than operator defined. Magic methods also work uh, as you would expect. Now, if, if you're used to using PyTorch, as most people in the audience are, everything I showed you might seem obvious. You know, yeah, Python has had loops and lists and classes since the very beginning. But talking to our production users who are used to you know, cramming models into a really restrictive graph-based paradigm, the idea that you can use these features is really mind-expanding. Uh, you really can get the expressivity and flexibility of PyTorch with the portability and performance that a graph-based approach can give you. So what's next for the JIT? Well, we'll definitely keep pushing on language features. Python is a big language, and even the subset used in PyTorch programs will take some time to fully support. But beyond that, we want to make sure that the JIT is available as a platform for building new tools and features for PyTorch and the community in general. So you'll hear about some of these efforts today. Lynn and uh, Shrep previewed some of them. Dimitro will get up here after me and tell you about quantization, which uh, will soon use the JIT to do automatic quantization of your model. Uh, David will be here later talking about our mobile launch, uh, which uses the JIT as a basis for a lightweight interpreter that can go on the device. And we're in the early stages of building out extension points to lower torch script models to graph compilers and accelerators like TVM, Glow, and XLA, which will help us deliver bigger performance wins and target new hardware. So please try it. Uh, give us feedback. It's all available today. 
TorchScript is pretty widely used within places like Microsoft, Facebook, and uh, later Sydney from Uber will be giving a talk about how they use TorchScript to put their full uh, prediction model on the car. Uh, but even so, it's still early days, and every bit of feedback, every bug report, every, you know, this was frustrating and weird and we didn't really understand why this happened, uh, is really valuable to us. We have tutorials and documentation up on the PyTorch website to get you started, and we're always monitoring the JIT label on GitHub uh, for feature requests and bug reports and just, you know, interested queries. So, thank you. <laughs>